Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Art 192 uh, Photoshop slash computer imaging, or I'm sorry, digital imaging, fall 2021 semester. Um, anyway, today we're going to move on to talk about typography. Um, you can see before you lesson seven, here is the before, and to the right is the after or completed version. And we're going to cover pretty much most of the tools that you can use with typography. But before we do, um, I have a little handout that's online <clears throat> to cover some of the basics of typography, just so that you understand how type is measured, um, the units that are used in measuring typography, some of the terminology that's used in typography and that sort of thing. And then I think you'll have a better understanding of how to use the tools or what they mean <clears throat> when you're using the character panel or the properties panel with regards to typography. So let's start with um, my first one here. Um, we have my little um, slideshow here that I did, typography, um, the basics. So you see here the word typography and the basics. And the typeface that is used for this is called Roman. It is or was one of the first, if not the first modern um, font that was ever used. And it was based on Roman type that was used. And that's why it's called Roman. It has a specific kind of proportioning system. It only has capital letters. It is, um, to this day, really very elegant. And um, they lifted the type from Trajan's column in Rome. And that's where they were able to get these um, really elegant letter forms. And so even some of the, most of the early modern typefaces were built upon this proportioning system and this typeface. And that's where you get the little feet that extend from here that are called serifs. Because um, in Roman times, they were chiseled in, and the edge of the chisel is what constructed these. Now, they may look somewhat decorative, but um, serifs do have a, a purpose today. And then especially with small type that you use, um, in, in, des in design, um, it adds to the readability or the legibility of, of the type itself or the, the words. So, and, uh, but then again, for those of you who are interested in web design, I would caution you against using serifs because they tend to get too small and break up um, on screen. So I pretty much am reluctant to use them except for headlines and subheads and that sort of thing. But um, most of the fonts that I use are the various typefaces, um, especially for body copy. Um, I use sans serif type for the web. It's a mixed bag for print. So anyway, that's where we get started. And let's talk about the different categories of type. There are basically five different categories. One is the one that I just mentioned, serif, and you can see the little feet. Then as technology developed, and especially in the early 20th century, um, they were able to eliminate the serifs. And when they did, they were able to change the proportioning system of the, of the fonts that they created. And in doing so, eliminating these serifs, they create the, thus the name sans serif or French without serifs, um, using a different proportioning system, they were able to create a much wider variety of, of fonts, extended, condensed, italicized, um, a whole bunch of different variations that in different weights that weren't possible with the um, older serif typefaces. So the first two, serif and sans serif, are the, the typefaces that are used the most um, and is for headlines, subheads, and uh, especially for, for body copy or for the, the text that you, large blocks of text that you read. Um, the next category is script based on uh, pen, you know, uh, color, calligra, calligra, 
calligraphic pens. So um, it's still used today, but not so much as it used to be. Um, as it used to be used. Um, script today is sort of a decorative typeface. Um, it's used in special occasions, more, more often than not in special occasions, like um, wedding announcements and birth announcements and that sort of thing. Just because I don't even think they teach um, cursive in school anymore. So it's difficult for people to read. Um, similar to what I was saying with um, serif on you know, a, a computer screen. Um, so if you want to use script, um, reserve it for very small blocks of text. And again, mostly have, if you're going to, going to use it in print um, for an ad or something like that, leave it for mostly headlines and subheads, you know, large block of text, but um, just a handful of words, just a few words. The next um, group is black letter. This was um, developed in around you know, 1000 or so AD by uh, the monks who hand lettered and, uh, the manuscripts, like the Carolingian manuscripts. And it was at this time that you'll notice that by hand lettering, they developed the lowercase letter forms here in a more formal manner. This too is still used today, but again, it follows more in a, of a decorative vein. It's not, I wouldn't recommend using it for, again, text, big blocks of text. I would re reserve it for special occasions when you have a headline or, uh, you know, a few words and a title or something that warrant this. Because again, in large blocks of text, I don't know if you've ever seen a manuscript up close, um, that, you know, monks had, like the had had hand lettered. It's very small, very precise. I don't know how they did it, um, um, but very difficult to read. And then the last category is decorative. And that's, <clears throat> there are just thousands and thousands of decorative typefaces today. And again, I would reserve those like script and block letter for just a few words that are fairly large um, that we'd use for a headline or a subhead. So while I've shown you the five basic categories, there are really only three different categories. There's serif, sans serif, and decorative. I would put today, I would put script and black letter under the, the category of decorative, even though they technically have their own um, group here. So in categorizing type, what they have done is they've broken down into three different groups. The main group, family, face and font, okay? So the family typeface, um, the family of, of fonts would be, for example, Helvetica, a sans serif, very popular, developed, I believe, in the 30s, um, used extensively today. So um, then you would have, um, this would, or the family of the type, I'm sorry, would be equivalent to a category. So this would fall under, Helvetica would fall under the family of um, sans serif typefaces. And then within that, you have the type face itself. And this, the name for this would be Helvetica. So that's a little bit more specific. But you can see, and I have not listed all of them here. These with, <clears throat> especially something like Helvetica or a whole range of fonts available within this typeface category. Now, a font, and you may have seen that a lot, it's in all computer graphics programs that offer, you know, any kind of typing abilities or, you know, text um, from Word to, um, you name it, Illustrator, Photoshop, all of them, that it's a, um, a particular font means that within the category of, or the type, the family of of, um, the, the, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied here. Um, the font, which falls under um, a particular type face, in this case, Helvetica, you can have all of these variations, but from bold italic and bold to light to ultralight, 
um, condensed black, condensed bold. Um, and, and as I said, there's a whole bunch of them that are that I haven't listed here that give you a variety <clears throat> of options of displaying um, text. Now the font, what it refers to within this particular typeface of Helvetica, and if we're looking at the font Helvetica regular, the font itself pertains to all of the caps or uppercase, the lowercase or small letter forms, the numerals and the special characters that are all especially designed with this weight in, design, in, in mind. Um, they may all seem very similar to one another, but if you begin to do a very um, strict um, comparison between them, for example, you know, regular and light, that they will make um, significant variations on and, and adjustments in the design of the letter forms so that they all work together quite nicely. And there are tools in Photoshop that allow you to tweak them somewhat, but I would I'll sh we'll show you that in a bit. I would discourage you from doing that. So again, we have a family of type, which is basically a category. Is it serif or sans serif, for example? Um, then within those categories, you have specific typefaces. And then within a particular typeface, like Helvetica, you may have only one or two fonts, or you can have dozens of them. It really depends on the typeface itself. Okay. The next uh, has to do with the different parts of the letter forms. And this I feel is an is important feature that when you begin to you know, work at your keyboard and type the letter forms out, that each of the letter forms rests on a line. Okay, and this is called the baseline. Now, there are tools in Photoshop and Illustrator and other programs that allow you to raise the type above or below the baseline. But by default, it rests, all of the type rests, rests on the baseline. Now, any part of the letter form that extends Below the baseline is called the descender. All of the letter, the lowercase letter forms um, will rest, you know, on, with a particular font or will rise up to a midpoint, which is called um, the waistline. Okay. Now, anything that extends above any part of the letter form that extends above the waistline like this vertical stroke in the D is called an A sender. So we have A senders and B senders. We have caps and lowercase, and by default, they all rest on a baseline, okay? Now, if you're wondering how type is measured, it's not measured from the baseline to the top of a capital letter or even the top of um, A sender. It goes from A sender to the descender. So depending on this, the style or the design of a particular font, we'll, um, you'll, you can make comparisons between illus, um, a typeface like Times Roman and Helvetica. And even though you might be using the same size type 12 point, that um, they may look decidedly different in size, and that has to do with how they were designed. You'll notice in this one, in this one, um, I've used Times Roman as my example, that the A sender actually extends above the capital letter just a little bit. Now, when you're setting type, or if someone specifies to you a particular size, they can say, I want the cap height to be a particular, you know size and then you can go by that but if you don't and you just use the settings that are available in photoshop and say i want 36 point type the way it's measured again is from the a sender to the d sender and you may have um, a block of text that has um, no d senders because maybe it's all they're all capital letters or just the nature of the words that you've used then the last thing that we have in terms of measuring that isn't talked about too much in the, these days, except if you're a type hound, is X height. And X height is the measurement from the baseline 
to the waistline. And that can, too can be specified, especially back in the day when you would go to typesetters and you know, ask them to set the type for you that you would say the, the X height needs to be a certain size. And then they would adjust everything else accordingly based on your recommend your, your request. So those are the basic parts. Some of the nomenclature that's used in um, typography and how it's measured is that um, type is measured in points and picas. There are a unique um, form of measurement and they can translate to inches quite easily. There are 12 points to a pica and there are six picas to an inch. So if you do the math, six times 12, you get 72 points in an inch. It's a relatively small unit of measurement, but the difference between 11 and 12 point type, for example, is quite noticeable to the human eye. It is discernible. You can tell the difference quite easily. And designers will very often argue over the difference between should we use six or seven point type and you think it would be such a um, you know minor difference that you know what's you know why does it matter? But it's very important to some, and, and for the better designers, it will make a difference in the end. And as I've um, mentioned several times now, type size itself is measured from the top of the A center to the bottom of the D center. There's some other terms that we should um, be familiar with, and those are um, what you call the capital letters. They're also called uppercase or UC is the abbreviation for them. And the small letters are also called lowercase or LC. These two terms um, uh, were developed or came to, 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 to be probably in the 18th century, um, 1700s, about the time that um, Benjamin Franklin had his um, type shop or his print shop. And the reason that they had them is that if they wanted capital letters, they were in case they actually had to physically take each of these letter forms and set them in a, in a uh, frame and tie them up and then lay them down and then ink, ink them <clears throat> and set the paper on top of it and then press the, would press down on top of it. So they had to hand set all of that. All the capital letters were in cases that were above, so they were called upper cases, and all the lowercase letters were in cases that were below, lowercase. Um, even though it's rare that you see anybody hand set type today, um, the terminology remains. If you want to selectively adjust the space between letters or words, and there is a tool in Photoshop to do that, it's called kerning. That's also a term that you should be familiar with. If you want to uniformly adjust the space between words or an entire line of type, that is called tracking. And there is a tool that enables you to do that in Photoshop. And the last one, which again is kind of like uppercase and lowercase, it's called letting. And that's the distance between the lines of type. And the re how that came to be, again, about the same time, the 18th century, is that um, in order to create additional space between lines of type, they would put these little slivers of lead in order to um, increase the, the space. They couldn't decrease it, but they could increase it. Now you can overlap, uh, overlap text, if you wish, for aesthetic reasons or you know, make a point with your design. So all these terms continue, uppercase and lowercase, kerning, tracking, and letting. They're very important. You should become familiar with them. This, um, I've kind of, um, if you were to look at, this is actually um, a setup for a, a newspaper. So technically this is not a headline, it's a masthead, but I'm using the terminology that would be used if you were setting up um, a, uh, an ad. So you're the largest, usually the largest element you know, in type on your ad, not always, it doesn't have to be, is usually the headline. 
And then you would have subheads. And then the smallest element is your body copy down below. So they generally go in that descending order. Most important elements usually are at the top. This is kind of the default in design that you do not have to adhere to, but it very often remains the case. The largest and most, the most important elements are usually at the top and they're the largest. And then in descending order, um, the least important elements are usually the smallest and at the bottom, the ones that you want to visually you know, catch the person's eye. If you're wondering on an eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17 sheet of paper, the size that you would use for copy, it's a range and it really depends, but to give you a ballpark of where to get started, um, body copy can go on eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It can range from generally between eight and 13 point. And the column width is usually 13 and a half picas to 48 picas. There's a reason for that. And I'll explain, especially for the 48 picas, that if you have a line of type or a body of type that extends beyond 48 picas, it will be very difficult for the reader to track from one line to the next with their eyes. So that's, you know, even if you look in your textbook, you'll see that probably the maximum width of a paragraph it's 48 picas. And if you look at most newspapers, they range or they're usually around um, uh, 13 and a half picas. So anyway, that gives you some a place to get started with type. Then subheads again for on a sheet of paper, eight and a half by 11, um, even a, a 11 by 17 can go from usually starting point size is 14 to 18 points. And headlines can start at 24 point and go all the way up to, you know, whatever size you need. Okay, so that's sort of a little overview of typography. Now let's go ahead and let's um, look at the lesson itself. I'll do that. And um, some of the features in here with um, type. You'll notice that the type tool is down here a little bit below, over to the left, below halfway. And when you select it, you can see if you have the classic mode set here for um, your toolbar, that we have the options menu up here. And we can see that here is the font that's chosen. And actually, this is the type, this is the face, Myriad Pro. And the font is semi bold. And if you want it, you know, you can see for Myriad Pro that we have six different fonts available. Now, if we were to switch to another typeface, um, we may have more, we may have less fonts available. The next would be um, the type size. And you can see that it is measured in points. And we know now that there are 12 points to a pica. There's six picas to an inch, and there's 72 points to an inch. You can also specify whether you want it sharp or crisp or smooth, and that sort of thing. Right off the bat, you can specify whether you want the text set flush left, ragged right, centered, or um, ragged left, flush right. You determine the size from here, or not the size, the color. You can determine here if you want to actually create some various warped text effects, which we'll get into. Okay. We can also have over here, we can have um, 3D effects, the very end, and we can also toggle back and forth between the character panels. So if I click here, you can see that the character panel pops up. We also have a paragraph panel. I won't talk about too much about that today. Let me go over them. Let me go ahead and create a brand new file. Let's do that. I'm going to go File New. And just eight and a half by eleven. Um, so I'm going to go to Print, and I want just the letter size. And I'm going to, so I want to go over each of the the features that you can use here. Um, I'll keep it 300 resolution, and I'm going to go back over here. And I'm going to go, well, I'll leave this one to the right, the finished one. 
So with the character panel up, I'll go ahead and I'll pull that off so we can see over here what we're doing. Now I'm going to switch the color to black. So we have black here. And then let's just select. We have Myriad Pro. And I'll just use that because that tends to be the default semi bold. And it's um, 20 points. Well, you can click anywhere on the screen to use as long as you have the type tool selected. And you'll notice underneath here, there are a couple of other variations. You can set type horizontally or vertically, which is done in this lesson. I rarely, if ever, use the next two tools. Again, these are a holdover from way back, vertical type, mask tool. And, um, and I'll explain why probably on Monday, why we'll do that, because I'll actually do the lesson on Monday, because we're kind of going pretty quickly with the lessons here. Okay, so they, those give you the various options. So I'll just click here. So you can click anywhere. And you can decide whether you want it centered, or you want it flush left or flush right, and you can always change it too. So I'm just, just going to select type, and I'll click here. You can see that it brings up some Greek in here. And instead of that, I'll go ahead and I'll type in here some type. Okay, and you can keep typing. And the thing of it is, when you do it this way, and I'm just typing gibberish here, it will continue to type on the same line until you hit the return key. And now it's using the default letting, and it's creating your second line, and then you would hit the return key again to, do, um, to create another um, line of type. But many, way, many times, unless you're doing a headline, um, if you want to bring in a, um, a large body of text, you would do it a little bit differently. So if I click the checkbox here and finish it, then that's the size. If I want to come back and edit it, I can click back in here. And I can highlight an individual letter form or the entire words. And then I can come back up here and I like doing it here, but you can also do it here with the character panel. And you can put in a specific point size yourself. You can use for a, um, select from a number of default sizes here, like so. Or I can use to the left. I wish Illustrator had this, but it doesn't. It, the little icon to the left of the point size, you can click and drag, and you'll see that it, until you get it to a size that you feel is visually appropriate for your design, you can just slide it back and forth. Likewise, when it's all selected, or if you only have one letter form selected, we can click here, or I can move this over. I can click on the font, and as I roll over each of these, you can see every time a separate font is selected, you get a preview of what it's going to look like. That can be very handy too. So I'm going to stick to Myriad right now. And let's go, let's beef it up a little bit to um, bold. Okay. Now, again, if I had only selected one letter form and highlighted it, I can make it a different color. I can also, instead of bold, the font, I can select, you know, maybe I wanted it italic for a you know, specific kind of effect. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that. And when I'm done, I just check it off. Now as I said, we can also, if I highlight the whole line, okay, if I want it to be flush left, I can do so. Notice that it goes, it moves to where I started typing. If I want it flush right, I can do that. And then if we go to the paragraph, styles, we can have it justified, justified with the last line, um, flush left, flush right, and totally justified. We can have a number of settings in here for paragraphs that we can work with. Now, if you want to type a block of text, and you already have some provided for you that might that you might want to use, it would be um, a large, you know, as I said, block of text, that maybe it would be 12 point, 11 point. Um, then what you would do instead 
so that it follows within a specific um, block is I would click the type tool and I would click and drag and I'd say that's how big the block that I want. Then I can come back here and let's select flush left. And instead of 87 point, I'm gonna go back down to 12. And you can see that it automatically now wraps, you know, when the line hits the edge of our boundary um, that we've specified the border, it automatically wraps to the next line and so on and so forth. And then if I hit the return key a couple of times and begin typing again, it will um, continue and it will remain inside that block. If we want to, we can increase or we can decrease the size of our columns accordingly, okay? So that it fits and works well within the boundaries that we have available in our design. So that works nicely too. So that's either for just a single line or a couple of lines of text or a big block of body of text, either way. <clears throat> and again, every time you do that, every, these, these become separate elements over here that you'll see every time you check the box with the type that it shows up over here and it will list Notice how I wrote some type, so it will give you the name of the word, so it's easy to identify what text block of text you're you're working you want to select or work with. Now let's go over each of these others separately. I showed you the font, or I showed you the typeface and the font, and now and the size. And now let's go ahead and work with the letting. So by default, it's set to auto. So if I, if I come back in here. And I click on the very end of this and I hit the return key and I hit more text. Okay, by default, setting it probably close to, if this is 87 point, it's probably close to 89 point. So there's about a two point gap between the D sender and an A sender. Okay. So if you want in for large blocks of text or for titles, this might be too big a gap. So if you wanna change that, I just simply click and drag and highlight it. Then I can come up here and instead of auto, I can go to specific settings. So I can go back to, if I set it at 72, it's gonna be really, really tight. But for a headline or a title of the, for example, the next project that you'll be working on, which will be to be a movie poster that for a large block of text with just a handful of words for the title of your movie, this will help to unify it and make it look like a single element rather than a couple of lines of text. It'll look like almost like a logo. And similar to what I showed you with the, um, the type size, similar with the letting, I can go ahead and I can click and drag the little widget to the left. And if I wanted to, I could actually overlap it, which was near impossible in the 18th century. Okay, you'd have to do it multiple times. And if any time you ever want to change any of these, I can go back to auto and I'm set. So that's what the letting does here. This is the type size, this is the font, and this is the type family or I'm sorry, not, yeah, typeface. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Oops. I'll just leave it as some, yeah, some type. There we go. So what do we do with the next? If I wanted, for example, less space between the E and the T, then what I would do is I would use this tool right here, which refers to the kerning. And again, I have the same options. I can either increase in metrics or I can decrease, or I can come back here and I can use the spinner. And I can actually tighten it up. So if I wanted it to look like so, if I felt that there was too much space between the words for my headline, then that would be a way of doing that. Okay. And if anytime you ever want to go back, just put the cursor between them. I can come back here 
and I can change it back to zero. And that opens it back up. Likewise, we can adjust the tracking. That's what this one is here to the right of the kerning. So if I select it all, and let's use the spinner, see how it stretches it out uniformly. So if I really want to extend the type almost to the you know, edge of, of each side of the, my design, I can do that without changing the height. So we can do that. We can see now it's set to 220. If I ever want to go back, I just go back to zero. Or if I want it set really tight, I could come back in here and use a negative number, use negative 10. And you can see that uh, there are a lot of designers that really like to set words really tight so that they're almost in a kiss fitting, you know, just touching one another just ever so slightly. Okay. And in some instances, for logos especially, that works really nicely. So this is tracking. Now, there are two, two, two tools that I caution you against using. This one here that allows you to affect, affect the, the height. So if you have a limited width in which to, to place your type, but you have more space vertically to fill, then we could use this tool right here, but it distorts the type. A type designer would cringe if you use this. In some instances, you know, maybe it's okay. So that's what that does. And you can, you know, inadvertently kind of um, create kind of a condensed or By doing that too. So again, we can go back to 100%. And that sets it back to normal. Likewise, if you have a limited um, height, but you have more width that you need to fill up, we can use this one. And you can see the height is remaining the same, but it's stretching the type out. And it does a pretty good job uniformly, but not Again, type designers would not appreciate this. Okie doke. So again, if you want to set it back, then this goes back to 100%. The next one's down here. Remember I talked about the baseline. When we come back here and we go back to the move tool, okay, and then I come back here and I select the type tool here, and I click little cursor, you can see that line that's hidden underneath. Well, if I want, let's say I wanted to move um, the T below. Then what I could do is I could use this tool right here, which allows me to adjust individual letter forms or the entire set of words above or below the baseline. So if I do that, you can see that I can set it like so. And if I want, you know, maybe this one, the M to be above, then I can do that as well. So you can create some kind of fun things with it. In Adobe Illustrator, you can also rotate the type as well. You can't do that here. So that's the way that that goes. That's what that does. If I want all of the type, to be um, in capital letters or full bold rather. Let me go ahead and get to put this back. Let's take this back to zero. So let me highlight all of it. And what we can do is if you want this to be a full bold, if it's not available, and notice how it looks kind of lumpy and it rounded off everything, it had these really crisp edges, and it doesn't look so good. So, you know, but that's in the event that the, the type family that you're using, the type face, doesn't have a font available that's um, with a particular font that has the weight that you're looking for. So maybe in a pinch, you might use that. So that's what that one does. This again is a faux italic. 
that looks a little bit better. This one is a good one that if you want all caps, we'll do that. <clears throat> I caution you against using all caps, except for in, in situations where you have just a handful of words. If it's if you have a big block of text, avoid it at all costs because it, again, it's one of those situations where it's difficult for the viewer to read. Okay, so that's what that does. The next one is a really good one in lieu of using all caps, and that is small caps. So you can see that you still have your at the um, the initial caps of each word or capital letters, but then in place of the small or lowercase letters, we have small caps. So again, it's a way of emphasizing the words and the letter forms um, and in a slightly you know, different kind of unique way. This is one of my favorites here, small caps. And then we have um, superscript and subscript. So if I highlight, if I made a one and I want a superscript, and by clicking that, it makes it a little bit smaller and pushes it up. Also, if I want subscript, it makes it a little bit smaller, pushes it down. If I want something underlined, then I can use this. In most cases, I think the underline feature isn't that nice. Looks a little horsey. The, um, the weight of the, the stroke is a little bit more than I like. If you want something or an entire word or individual letter um, to be a strike through, you can do that. We also have here, we have um, options available for us for standard ligatures. Ligatures are not available with all fonts, with all typefaces. What it does is, you know, in this case, I don't even know that it has it. If I put an F I here, Let's take off the caps. Yeah, there you go. See how the F and the I are combined? That is a form of a ligature. If I turn that off, now it's separate. And again, it's a nice, it's a, an important design element. We have some other options available here too that are available with some fonts and some are not. Contextual alternatives, you can see here, um, discretionary ligatures. For this typeface, we don't have any available. Stylistic alternatives, we can do that. And again, if we want, let's put one, two, let's highlight it. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Let me, put, let me type it one, and then highlight it. Let's see if I can get this guy to work here. There we go. See how it changed the size of it to fit within the type size that we specified. So that, that does that. One of my favorites though, is if we come back here, is when you're doing um, spell checking. And it has to do with different languages. So I'm going to go ahead, and this is the word that I always use, Montreal. OK. So I'm going to highlight Montreal. And what if I were was designing an ad or a brochure that was to be printed and published in different languages and to be distributed in different countries, or even the same country? Let's switch this one from English to French. How about Canadian French? And you don't see any difference right now for this word. But if I come back up here and I go to edit and I select spell checking. Now, it doesn't like my F-I-M-E. Do I want it dime? <laughs> um, so I'm going to ignore that one. Now I'm going to go to the next one, and it goes to Montreal. Well, in English, that's spelled correctly, but if it were French, you'll notice that the accent grave over the e, e. So if I go ahead and I um, 
change, it knows to add that accent over the E. Likewise, if I change this from Montreal, from French Canadian back to English, and it has USA English and UK English, and I do the spell check again, <clears throat> and I come back on here and I do spell checking. Again, it's gonna not like fine, should be dime or whatever, but I'm gonna go just ignore it. And again, now it finds it, it's incorrect for the word Montreal and it shows where it, what it should be. In, in English, we remove the accent. So now I can go ahead and choose to change it or not. And we're done with our spell checking. So that's what this does down here. And like what you see up here, you have a few more features. Um, you know, we have the smooth and the sharp and that sort of thing. And also under over to the right under our properties panel, I haven't talked about that much, but you can see that all of the same features here are here. So there's a lot of redundancy. Okay. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. Um, next Monday, we'll go over the specifics and I'll show you how we can take type and have it follow a path. We, how we can take type and we can set it vertically. We can also use type as a mask and we can put an image behind it. And those are some you know, useful things that you can do with type. Now, my personal feeling is that if you're going to do some really elaborate decorative or fancy things with typography, you may wanna to switch to Adobe Illustrator. It has far more controls and um, better tools to manipulate and uh, to use typography. Um, for most things, generic things, um, Photoshop does a good job, but it's not perfect. Um, anyway, that's where we're going to, I'm going to leave you today with that. And I'll see if there's anybody with any questions. Um, if not, then I will pause the recording and I will say goodbye, say goodbye today for today. And um, I'll see everybody Monday and I will do the lesson itself on, on Monday. But I wanted to give you a background of typography, <clears throat> terms, nomenclature, um, you know, how explain how type is measured and things like that, various parts of letter forms and all that. So that when you're back in here and you're in Photoshop or Illustrator, you're gonna understand what all these tools do that allow you to really effectively control type. It was Adobe Illustrator in 88 that when it came out, um, it basically put typesetters out of business because it put it in the hands of the designer. And instead of going to the service bureau for um, a typesetting, they just had it. The designer was able to do it on his little Macintosh, you know, Apple Macintosh, and when he was done with it, you know, have it printed out and set up the, the, the boards for his, his ads and do it that way. It was a much more laborious, kind of tedious task before doing it yourself this way. And over the years, they've made a lot of really significant improvements. Um, there are lots and lots of typefaces available, some that cost, some don't. If you have your, your full subscription to Adobe, you should ha have access to all of their fonts. There are tons of them. There are some that are on Google, Google fonts and others that are available for free. Be careful though, when you get them, you download them from other sources. Um, they could be in, infected with a virus. Um, the safest thing to do is to use the Adobe ones, but that's pretty much it. Um, I will have this uh, posted for you shortly on um, YouTube, should you need to um, review or to see what I've done here uh, for a second time. That's pretty much it. Okay, so I'll say goodbye. If there aren't any questions, let me know. And I will um, let you guys speak and I'll answer them best that I can. No?
Okay, and I will say goodbye. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.